it is such a pleasure to be here. Um, man, I just want to start by saying uh, thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for, as Dan mentioned, um, as a church, uh, you support and pray and, and labor with us, um, those of us who work with InterVarsity on college campuses in the area. Um, so thank you. Thank you for, um, for partnering with us. Thank you for giving uh, to not only support all of the different like global and local ministries that you do, but including InterVarsity. Uh, if you're not familiar with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, we're a, we're a campus ministry, um, and our, our purpose, our goal um, is to help students and faculty uh, explore the intersection between their, what they're doing in college, what they're learning, and their faith in Jesus. And we do that by doing Bible studies on campus, by training students how to reach their friends, by doing uh, outreaches, um, and you've been laborers with us. I also want to say thank you to those of you who, you know who you are, for maybe almost a decade now, you've, as a families or individuals, have partnered with uh, our work, have come on campus, have prayed on campus, um, have sent me words of encouragement. Um, thank you. I also want to say thank you for the ministry of this church. Dan didn't mention this, but um, I, I, I was baptized right there. <laughs> um, that this is this is my that my first church I was ever a part of where um, I heard the gospel where I decided I want to become a follower of just of this Jesus. Um, so many thank yous. Um, you know, in in uh, in Western cultures, whenever we whenever you introduce somebody, right? Maybe somebody's going to come and speak or they're like an honored guest or something like that, you usually say a lot about like that person, like where they went to school, their accomplishments, like who they are, and then they come and they speak, right? They stand on sort of their merits. Um, in Eastern cultures, uh, you tend, to, when someone gets introduced as an honored guest, you tend to say a lot about like who their parents were, like what family they come from, and you'll say like one word, like this person's grandparents and parents were these people and this person's going to come speak to us, right? So there's nothing wrong with either, they're just different. And so I think I would be remiss if I didn't say that my parents are here today. And, um, <laughs> and so, so much of the man that I am is because of them and because of their investment and because of who they are. And so if there's anything that blesses you this morning, you should go thank them. And if there's anything you don't like, you know, you can go talk to them. Um, so, um, but Betsy and I are, are so excited to be here. Uh, Betsy's my wife. She's over there as well. And our son Arjun's back in the, uh, in the kids area. Um, and as, as uh, Pastor Dan mentioned, I'm going to be speaking out of the book of Jonah. So you have, if you haven't turned there, turn there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to gonna reference the text a lot. Um, but before I jump into this book, uh, which is very like Old Testament, um, and it's a really, like, short book of the Bible, right? Um, in my Bible, it's one page, back and front. Um, but Jonah, uh, the, the, the character of Jonah in this story is uncomfortable through the entire story. Like, his character is uncomfortable through the entire... There's, like, 1% of the story where he's like, I'm happy. But 99% of the story, he's really, really uncomfortable. And the original readers who would have read the story of Jonah would have, um, would have identified with his character. Like, what is God trying to teach Jonah? How is God teaching Jonah? That would be the thing that the original readers who read this would have been like, this is what God's trying to teach us. So, if this morning, if as you hear this message preached, you find yourself feeling uncomfortable... That's probably a good thing, because you're probably hearing it the way it was intended to be heard. Or maybe that's my way of saying don't kill the messenger, right, for a challenging word. Um, I, co I commonly tell college students, we, we study scripture a lot in InterVarsity. We do this thing called inductive Bible study, and um, most of our ministry on campus is helping students lead other students into God's word. Um, which the college uh, world can be an interesting place to study scripture because it's a very skeptical place, very cynical place. People have lots of questions. Um, and I, I think that's actually a good thing about 
the university world and college students in particular is they won't take things at face value. They'll be curious about it. They'll ask questions like, how do I even know this is real? How do you actually live this out? What does this look like? Um, and something I commonly tell university students is that scripture, God's word, is like hard candy, right? You can't just like bite into hard candy or you'll like, you know, strain your jaw, you'll chip your tooth. You gotta like let it sit, right? And you gotta work on it and you gotta turn it over and over time to really get the full flavor of hard candy. Aren't you glad you came to church today to learn about hard candy? <laughs> Right? That, that's how hard candy works. You need some effort, you need some time to really experience it. And God's word is the same way. You gotta turn it over, you gotta consider it, you gotta think about it, you gotta feel it to then work it out into your hands and your feet. And it takes time. And the same is true, especially for the book of Jonah. It's hard candy. And I really wanna invite us to sit in the the truth of this word and the tension that this word brings up to really then experience the transformation it can bring in our life. Can we do that? Amen? Yes. All right, so let's read it. So um, I'm going to jump into the middle of the story. So I'm going to start reading in chapter 3, verse 1, but we're going to talk about the whole thing. So here's what it says, chapter 3 of the book of Jonah, starting in verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. And sackcloth and is just sort of a sign of repentance, of turning from their wickedness. Let's skip down to verse 10. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Oh, snap. <laughs> it's about to get real, right? So I have three points that come from this story. Three things that we learn by looking at who God pursues in this story. Three things we learn looking at who God pursues in the story of Jonah. Um, and I've entitled this message, The God Who Pursues, right? So the first thing that we see is that God pursues Jonah. The first thing we see is that God pursues Jonah. So just to set some context for what we just read, when you back up two chapters to the very beginning of the book of Jonah, in the very first verse, God calls Jonah to go to a place called Nineveh and to preach against it because its wickedness has risen up to God. In the third verse, Jonah runs. It says that he went down to a place called Joppa, paid money, got on a boat, and headed for a place called Tarshish. And oh, did Jonah run. I have a, a slide here to just give us some geographical bearings. So Nineveh is like right over there, right? So it's like to the northeast, about 500 or so miles. Tarshish is in the exact opposite direction right? The contrast couldn't be more striking, right? God calls Jonah to go east. He decides, no, I'm going to go west. God calls Jonah to go over land. He decides, no, I'm going over water, right? And maybe to continue the contrast, God decides that if Jonah doesn't want to go to the great city of Nineveh, he sends him into a great storm, which is exactly what happens, right? He pays money, gets on this boat, heads out on the Mediterranean Sea. And, uh, and I find it also interesting that, um, God calls Jonah, go to Nineveh, preach against it. And Jonah doesn't just like say no and just like stay where he is. 
he feels the need to like physically relocate himself to run from God, right? He doesn't just stay where he is. He runs away. Gets on this boat. They run into this like huge Category 5 hurricane in the Mediterranean Sea. And so, and it's really bad. Like there's sailors on board this boat and they're freaking out. They're, they're taking cargo. They're throwing it overboard. They're calling out to their gods. Um, and it tells you something about how bad this storm is, right? These sailors have probably made this trek like multiple times. They've probably hit bad weather before, but they're freaking out over this storm, right? It'd be like if you were on a, on a, on a plane and if you fly off and you know that you hit turbulence and the captain gets on board, um, the intercom and he says go back to your seats put on your seatbelt. Uh, you know we're gonna hit some turbulence but imagine if you were on a plane and the captain got on the thing and he's like go to your seats sit down put your seatbelts on and start praying right now <laughs> right you'd be like we're gonna die right like so this is a really bad storm and what is our friend Jonah doing he goes below deck and falls asleep like you got to be really asleep to fall, like to be asleep in a storm like this, but he falls asleep. Have you ever wanted to escape your reality so much that you sought sleep? That there was some anxiety, some discomfort, some grief, some pain, something you just didn't want to face in life that you're like, I just need to go to sleep. You just wished you could escape it by going to sleep. That's what's happening to Jonah here. Right, He's not just physically fleeing God's call, but even consciously, he's running from God. Oh, did Jonah run from God? But there's a captain on board this boat, and he comes below deck, and he sees Jonah sleeping, and he says to him basically what all of us would have said, like, what are you doing? Get up. And the text says that he, he tells Jonah, call on your God, Maybe he'll notice us and he'll relent. And if you read the passage in chapter 1, the captain tells Jonah to do this, and Jonah does nothing. Like, he does nothing. He doesn't pray. He doesn't do anything. He just sort of, is, he's there. Which makes you wonder, it makes me wonder, does Jonah even care, like, if the boat breaks apart? Does Jonah care about any of the other people on board this boat? He knows why the storm is hitting them, but does he even care? But there's sailors on board this, this boat, and the text tells us, like, they care, they're freaking out, and they do this thing called casting lots. And casting lots is just sort of like an ancient, like, spiritualized form of, like, flipping a coin or drawing straws to figure out, like, a decision in a particular situation. So in this situation, they're trying to figure out, like, who might be responsible for this? So they cast lots, and the lot falls on Jonah. Interesting. And then they ask him, like, you know, what work do you do? Who is, like, uh, where are you from? What people are you from? What country are you from? And Jonah tells them, he says, I'm a Hebrew. I worship the God of heaven who made the dry land and the sea. And if I was a sailor on board this boat, I would have been like, and you tell us this now. Like, you know the guy who runs the water and you've just been conveniently keeping that to yourself, right? And so he tells them this, and, and he tells them, like, I've been running from God. And so the sailors freak out even more, like, what have you done? And, the, and, and this is where it gets insane, right? Maybe you've heard the story of Jonah before. Maybe you've heard it in Sunday school. Maybe you've heard it in popular culture. But we miss the insanity of this story because what happens next is Jonah tells them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. And it'll become calm for you because I know, like, it's, it's my fault that this has happened to you. Which is crazy that he says that to them. And at first it seems like maybe Jonah's, like, being really sacrificial and really noble. Like, he's willing to sacrifice himself to save all these people. But think about what Jonah doesn't suggest. He doesn't suggest, like, how about I turn back to my God and, like, repent and do what I, he had called me to do. Or how about all of us on this boat turn to my God and, like, we'll see what happens. Like, what better way not to go to Nineveh than to drown right here in the Mediterranean Sea? Right? You're getting the picture. Jonah's not a good prophet. Right? So he, he and, like, and to make other people responsible for your death. Right? He could have just, like, jumped overboard, be like, peace, guys. You're going to be okay. Let me just die. But he, 
he tells them to throw him overboard and basically make them responsible for his death, right? So it, it, it's crazy. He's still running from God to this point, up to this point. This is his final plan, like, kill me, and I can get away from God. And the storm's getting worse and worse. The sailors don't want to do it. They don't want to throw him into the water. Eventually, it gets so bad, they pick him up, they hurl him into the sea, and as soon as his body hits the water, the entire sea grows calm. And Jonah starts to sink into the Mediterranean Sea. And he thinks, maybe now I've done it. Like I've gotten away from God and his call. But what does God do? He sends this gigantic sea creature to come and swallow Jonah, a.k.a. rescue him. And it's in this fish that Jonah finally does what he wouldn't do on the boat, which is call out to God. Right? And it says he's in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And we don't know if it takes him three days and three nights to call out to God or if he does it at some point in there. But eventually he calls out to God and says, like, I'll, I'll, I'll say salvation comes from you. I'll turn back to you. And God commands the fish and it spits him out onto dry land. And Jonah is saved. The thing about this story that is so encouraging to me, that is so powerful to me, is that no matter the extraordinary lengths Jonah goes to to run from God, God is even more extraordinary in running after Jonah. Like, you got to get this. Because, right, Jonah says, I'm running from God. God calls him to go to Nineveh. He runs. He gets on a boat to sail out into the Mediterranean Sea and go the opposite direction. God sends the weather after him. Right? He decides, I'm going to sleep. I'm not going to deal with this. God sends a non-believing captain to come down and tell him, call on your God. This captain does not know Jonah's God. Jonah decides, I'm not going to do anything. He remains quiet. So then they cast lots, and chance goes in the favor of Jonah. And he's like, okay, just kill me now. And God sends a sea apparatus, an organic life form, to swallow Jonah and save him. No matter the extraordinary lengths Jonah goes to to run from God, God is even more extraordinary in running after Jonah. What's the point? No matter the extraordinary attempts that we take to run from God, God is even more extraordinary in running after us. Somebody say amen. Amen. Right? No matter the frantic attempts that we make to... um, that that leads to selfish actions in our life or addictions in our life or failures in our life, no matter the ways that we try to ignore God and escape reality, God is relentless in his pursuit of me and you. A lot of times we read the story of Jonah or maybe you've heard about the story of Jonah and you think it's about a fish. It's not. It's not. Or maybe we think the story is about this prophet, this guy who ran from God. But really the story is about God running after a prophet. Right? Many, and it's a microcosm of the entire story of Scripture. It's a micro story of the entire story of Scripture. See, many people think maybe that, um, that the Christian faith is about judging you for running from God or blowing it or failing God. And that maybe if you felt bad about what you've done bad, then you'll start to be a good person. Or maybe the Christian faith is about instructing you on how to live life to achieve some sort of relationship with God. But really, what I see in the scriptures, what I see in the story of Jonah, is that the Christian faith is about surprising you with the mercy of God, that it's not about achieving something with God. It's about receiving a relationship from God. And it's about surprising you that no matter the ways that you um, fail God or run from God or try to live up to his standards, God is even more extraordinary. See, God will always outmatch you, outpace you, outrun you with his mercy. He will always do that. That is the the theme, the story of Jonah that we see in the first two chapters. God runs after us and invites us to call on him. Maybe the only reason you walked in here this morning was to hear that God has been after you. 
that maybe there's ways small and big and medium that you've been running and ignoring God and his call and his design for your life. And maybe even the storms in your life is not God punishing you, but God trying to turn your face back to him and say, I've been after you, and I've been coming after you out of my mercy, not out of my anger and my hatred for you. That's the first thing. God pursues Jonah, and in that we see his pursuit of all of us. Here's the second thing. Y'all still with me? We're still here? Okay. God pursues the nations. Number one, God pursues Jonah. Number two, God pursues the nations. Jonah is a really unique story in, in the scriptures because he's the only prophet who is called to go and preach to people who weren't Jews and actually to go to where those people are, to go to a different nation and actually preach to them. He's the only prophet who's told to do that. And what's ironic about the story of Jonah is that when Jonah encounters these people from other nations, it's the other nations that respond to God better than Jonah does, right? When Jonah got on board the boat, it was the sailors who were like turning to God. Like even when they throw him into the boat, um, they're calling out, they're turning from their gods that they were calling to at the very beginning and they're calling out to Jonah's God, right? And at the end, when the, when the sea grows calm, they're making vows to God. They're, they're making uh, sacrifices to this God that they didn't even know about, right? Jonah just wanted to die, right? When, when Jonah gets to Nineveh in, the, in, the, in chapter 3 that we read, right? Just like that, everybody turns from their wickedness. And Jonah's angry about it. Right? It's the other nations that are responding better to God than Jonah is in the story. Right? In fact, Jonah's the only organic life form in the story that doesn't really listen to God. Right? There's sailors that listen to God. There are Ninevites that listen to God. There's a fish that listens to God. Later on, there's a plant and a worm that all listen to God. <laughs> like Jonah is the only one who doesn't listen to God. The other nations respond better than Jonah does. What's the point God's trying to make in this story? The point is this, is that God's love, his affections, are not restricted to any one people or nation, but has always, always, always been for the entire world. Right? There, there is no one culture or ethnic group that has a monopoly on God and his gospel. There's no one nation or culture that's the best expression of God and his kingdom. And when a nation starts to think that, like Jonah had started to think about his people, God is really quick to show him that he shows no favoritism, but accepts women and men from any nation, any tribe, any people group that are willing to humble themselves and turn to him, right? There's this, there's this sort of cord that runs through the entire Bible, entire, entire scripture. And you might think of it like the soundtrack to the Bible, right? We live in Orlando, so when you go to Disney or Universal, right, you just hear soundtracks, movie soundtracks, right? You're, you, and you walk and you're like, that's Aladdin, that's Mulan, that's Avengers, Bring me Thanos, right? You just, it brings you back to these movies, right? Um, there's, there's a song, there's a soundtrack to the Bible that plays over and over and over again. And when you hear it, it brings you back to the universal purposes of God, right? And that's his affections and his love and his pursuit of all nations, right? When you read the, the very first book of the Bible in Genesis, Genesis chapter 12, when God calls a man named Abraham, and he says, I'm going to bless you, right? Abraham's going to become the father of the Jewish nation. He says, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to reveal myself to you for this reason, so that you and your people will be a blessing to the nations, so that you would reveal me to the nations, right? You go a little further and you start reading the Psalms. And over and over again, the psalmist says that God's salvation will extend to the ends of the earth. You go into the prophets and you hear, God, you hear them talk about, even in Isaiah, um, and Jesus quotes this later, even in Isaiah, God says that his temple would be a house of prayer for all nations. In the book of Isaiah, it says that. Right? You come to the book of Jonah and you see these other nations responding to God and turning to him over the response of the people of Jonah, the prophet of God. 
you get to the New Testament, Jesus does this all the time. But even at his birth, right? This is such a Christmassy passage, so sometimes we miss this. But the wise men, the magi who came from the east were not Jewish followers of God. They had come following a star. And they're some of the first people to worship the Messiah. Non-Jews. You go further and you get to the book of Acts and there's, there's this, uh, the, the disciples are all gathered there on the, this day that we call Pentecost, right? Acts chapter 2. And there's stand, all these people who do not speak other languages, who are one ethnic group, the Holy Spirit comes on them and they start proclaiming God's um, uh, wonders, who he is. They start worshiping him in other languages that they do not speak. It's as if God is affirming that he wants People who speak other languages to worship him. He wants worship to spread to places outside of Israel. Right? And you get, to, you get to the last book of the Bible, right? Cover to cover. Revelation chapter 7. The writer of Revelation is the disciple of John. And he has this vision of the end of time, of the end of the world. And he, sees, he says, before the throne uh, and before the Lamb of God, I saw a great multitude of people from every tribe from every nation, from every language, worshiping God. Every, every, every. Like, it, John just didn't say, I saw a group of people worshiping God. Like, their distinctions mattered. John saw their distinctions to God, cover to cover. Right? The, the, the scriptures, the Bible is not, God is not colorblind. He's very color aware. He's very ethnicity aware. He's very language aware. He has always wanted to build a multi ethnic family. Somebody say amen. God has always wanted to build a multi ethnic church. That's the expression that he wants to build in this world. And it's important to know that this isn't some, this isn't some like politically correct thing to say this. Like it's a Genesis to Revelation biblical thing to say that God has always wanted every nation, every tribe to worship him and to come into relationship with him. The question then becomes for you and I is if this is the soundtrack of the Bible, will you dance to it? Will you dance to this song that's playing across history, across time, across the scriptures? Will you join God in his pursuit of people from every ethnicity and culture right here and now? It's so important to get a passport and to go to places, to go to other nations, but our city our neighborhoods, our schools are ethnically, culturally, linguistically diverse. We can join God in his pursuit of the nations right here. I, w I don't want to settle for homogeneity in the expression uh, of, of local churches in, in our world. I, I don't want to settle for sameness because God doesn't settle for that. Right, even when you think about popular, pop, really popular passages, right? Like there's, we call the last thing Jesus said to his disciples, the Great Commission, right? Matthew 28. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples and we'll quote, to teach them to obey everything that I commanded you, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and surely I'm with you always. But who are these disciples that he's asking us to make? He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, right? So when I read that text, if I'm not making diverse disciples, I'm not living out that text. If I'm not inviting people from diverse backgrounds to consider Jesus and who he is and to come into my community of faith, then I'm not living out that text, let me give you one more. Right when Jesus goes into the temple and he starts flipping over tables and taking names, right, he's so mad, right, that the, these money changers are, are exploiting people, right? And he goes into this place and uh, he says, after he flips over the tables and drives out all these money changers, we, we tend to focus on 
um, the part of that passage where he says, you've made God's house into a den of robbers, right? That these corrupt people were exchanging money and overcharging people and were exploiting people in that way. But what does he say before that? He says, he quotes Isaiah and says, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. And the context of what's going on here is these money changers had set up their tables in a part of the temple called the court of the Gentiles. It was the one place in the temple in Jerusalem that people who were non-Jews were able to come and have a quiet space of meditation and prayer and to seek this God. But they had maybe knowingly or unknowingly inhibited them from coming into the temple. God has designed his place of worship to welcome all nations. The question for you and I, the hard candy question for you and I, is will we join God in that? That our places of worship, that our IDRs, that our community groups and our mom's groups and our dad's groups and our men's groups would be places that welcome intentionally people from all nations and does not settle for homogeneity. I want to just give you one practical application here because there's so much that can be said about what to do in response to this. Would we pray? Would we pray? Would you gather in your groups? Would you gather in your families? Would you, when you spend time with Jesus, pray and ask, God, I don't want to settle for a community of faith that's homogeneous. And would you remove my blinders to the people who are different than me? Would you help me learn and listen and go to the nations right here and right now? God pursues, the jo God pursues Jonah, number one. God pursues the na nations, number two. And here's the last thing. God pursues your enemies. God pursues your enemies. There's four chapters in the book of Jonah. In the first three chapters, you're not really sure why does Jonah not want to go to Nineveh? Why is he so resistant to God? Why is he running from God? When you get to chapter four, well, three and four, it starts to really become clear. If you look at the text in uh, chapter three, verse four, when Jonah gets to, to Nineveh, this is his message. 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's eight words in the English language. Like I've probably said over 3,000 words this morning and somebody's still falling asleep. But eight words. <laughs> and the entire city turns. Regardless, it's just eight words. They turn from their wickedness. Right? And, and Jonah doesn't even mention God. It's almost as if, it's a very limited message, right? It's almost as if he's proclaiming what will happen, right? Like, 40 more days and you're all going to die. Peace. <laughs> Bye. Like, it's just, it's like what he maybe wants to happen. But there's no mention of God. There's no mention of turning to God. 40 more days and you'll be overthrown. Regardless, the entire city from the king all the way down to the animals turn to God. They turn from their wickedness. And it's important to have some context here. Um, Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And the Assyrian Empire was a very cruel and oppressive nation. They oppressed the Jews, they oppressed neighboring nations, um, and they were particularly a threat to the northern kingdom of Israel, where Jonah lived. So they were enemies to Jonah and his people. And God had called him to go and preach against them. And so you can maybe imagine, maybe there's some modern day examples that will get us in the shoes of Jonah, right? What it must have felt like for God to call him to go and do this. Maybe it's, maybe it's what like a Holocaust survivor might feel if they were called to go and share God's love with an SS Nazi general. Or maybe it would be like what an ethnic minority in this country would feel if they were called to go and share God's love with the white supremacist group. Or you can flip those, right? If an SS Notch, the general going, called to the Jews, or a person from white supremacist group going and being called to go and share God's love with an ethnic minority, right? Maybe that's something of what Jonah felt. But I, I think it's, 
it's too easy to claim that Jonah was just some obvious uh, bigot, right? Some obvious person with racial prejudice in his heart um, and miss the relevance of this story um, to me and you, right? Because Jonah's prejudice, his bigotry, isn't overt. When you read the story, his prejudice is really subtle. It's really subtle. This is this um, prophet, spiritual leader of God, right, who's called by God to go to Nineveh, and, and he doesn't want to go. And even when he gets to, uh, on board the, the, the boat with the sailors, he doesn't tell them, like, I don't care about you. That's why I'm not telling you that we might all die here, and it might be my fault. Like, he doesn't tell them that. He's sort of kind of forced to do it. Um, and even when he gets to Nineveh, he doesn't tell them, like, 40 more days and you'll all be overthrown, and I really hope that happens. He just says it, right? It's really subtle. No one knows about his hatred, his prejudice, his bigotry. Only God knows. Only God knows. And whether Jonah opposed the people of Nineveh because of um, what, how they threatened his people or because of his own national pride for his own people, whatever it might be, Jonah saw the people of Nineveh as the other. He saw them as the other. And when you start to see a group of people or a person as the other, you reduce them. You reduce the image of God in them. Right? There's something that the Bible teaches, the very beginning, that we're all made in the image of God. And what that means is we have inherent dignity and worth and value. It doesn't matter your gender. It doesn't matter your ethnicity. It doesn't matter whether you're disabled or not. It doesn't matter whether you're a criminal or a felon. It doesn't matter whether you contribute to society or not. You are endowed by your creator with worth and dignity. And when you start to other somebody, you attempt to reduce that image. You attempt to reduce the value and dignity of a person, and you treat them as less than human. I remember the day after 9-11 happened. I was in high school. I was a part of this church, actually. I was, I was in high school, and I remember going to my first class the day after 9-11 happened and walking into my class and sitting down, um, and my friend at the time turning around and looking at me, and he sort of sarcastically said to me, thank you for what you and your family did yesterday. And in that moment, he attempted to reduce me, to reduce the value and dignity and treat me as less than human. See, the othering of a person or a group of people, it happens really subtly. You don't just jump from like, I hate people. It happens really subtly. Maybe it starts with, with just noticing the strangeness or the difference or the oddity of somebody who's different than you. And then that moves to beginning to caricature or stereotype that person because of that thing that is different from you. And then that moves to eventually not engaging in relationship with those people, moving yourself out of proximity from those people, which then moves to not really caring about their privileges and their rights and their dignity and what happens to them if it doesn't matter to you and your community, which then eventually moves to dehumanizing them, dehumanizing a group of people. It's subtle. It happens subtly to no longer see somebody as made in the image of God. And it's especially subtle in our hearts when that person or those group of people have done something against us. Have done something against us. Like what Jonah started to feel towards the people of Nineveh. See, the propensity, this is heavy, this is heavy. The propensity of the human heart is to focus on yourself and on people like you. That's the way our hearts are bent. That's the way they are bent and crooked because of sin and because of the damage in our world. Right? We're focused on ourselves and on people like us. And, and racial prejudice, bigotry, racism as a larger thing, it's not just an individual issue, though it is. But it's also communal. There's also a corporate uh, dimension to it. It's both individual. It's both personal and it's both corporate. It's not just one or the other. 
Um, right? It's, 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 it's not just an education problem, right? It's not just if we would just make everybody aware that our differences are to be celebrated, and when I cut and you cut, we all bleed red, so we're going to be all right, right? Like, it's not just if we told people that, that would fix it, though it might help, right? And it's not just a systemic and legal issue, though it is, right? The way the human heart works, the way the world is bent, um, we set up systems that marginalize certain groups of people. The way the human heart works, it does that. Um, but at its core, it's not just that. If we solve those, if we just made systems more equitable, then things would be better. That wouldn't fix the problem because prejudice and bigotry is a heart issue, right? It's a spiritual problem that affects communities and individuals. It's a spiritual problem. See, it's, it's like, and all sin is like this. All sin is actually like this. It's like a conveyor belt at the airport, right? You know those, like, people movers, those horizontal escalators? Like, I like to lie down on them. Just take me to my gate because I'm so lazy, right? So it's like a conveyor belt, right? Like, you can walk on it, and you'll move even faster towards your gate. Or you can stand still, and it's still going to move you. Prejudice and bigotry is sort of like that. You can personally get involved and move towards othering people. And the way the world works is it's going to help you towards that. Or you can stand neutral on it, and you're still going to get moved in the way that evil and racist systems and racism moves you. And all sin is like this, right? Greed is like this. If we live with a human heart in the United States of America or any, like, you know, first world country materialism, greed, the desire to covet and acquire more things, we're constantly bombarded with that message, right? So you can't stand neutral on greed. It's going to tempt you. It's going to move you towards being greedy, the way the world works and the way our hearts work, right? And I, and I often hear this. I hear this on college campuses a lot, too, when we talk about prejudice and bigotry, when we look at a passage like Jonah and we talk about Jonah's sin in this passage being that prejudice, you know, people will say to me, and very honestly, very honestly, they'll say to me, you know, when I, when I look at at least, you know, this country, I notice that, um, you know, slavery is over. Like we had the civil rights movement. Um, it seems like we've made laws that make things better for everybody. It seems like there's so much more acceptance of multiculturalism. It seems like things are way better than they used to be. And maybe the reason we keep having problems is because people like you keep bringing up the past and keep bringing up, like, this prejudice and the differences between us. Maybe that's why we keep having problems is because people like you. And I understand the sentiment of that. I understand the honesty of that. But I find it odd that we don't talk about other human wrongs in the same way. Like, we don't talk about other sin that way. We're not like, you know, people are a lot more honest today than they used to be. Like back then, they were way worse. They were way more dishonest back then. So we don't really need to talk about honesty or corruption or anything like that, right? People don't talk like that. Or, you know, we're not like, we don't need to talk about lust anymore. Like who struggles with lust? Like back then, it was way worse. Lust and objectification and trafficking was way worse back then. Why are we talking about it today, right? Here's the reality. Time does not heal sin. Repentance before God is the only thing that heals sin, right? You wouldn't take this argument for your Wi-Fi connection. Y'all don't get me, right? You, if you went to like a Starbucks or any coffee shop and you tried to get on the internet and it was moving slower, it was booting you off over and over again, and you went up to the barista and you're like, hey, what's going on with the internet? And if that guy was like, yo, remember dial-up? Like, things are way worse back then. Like, you can connect without wires to the internet, man. It's so, that's how I imagine a barista would talk, right? It's so much better today. Like, why are you complaining, bro? Go sit down, right? You would leave and leave, like, 50 bad reviews on Facebook, right? You'd be so upset. Time will never heal sin. The only thing that does is repentance before God, turning to God. Right? We have to turn against that conveyor belt and walk in the opposite direction of it. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the good news of the gospel. We need to practice things like acknowledging our prejudice and engaging in cross-cultural relationships to move against the grain of prejudice and bigotry in our world. You can't stand 
neutral on it. So what does, what does God do with Jonah to address his animosity, right? What does God do? He gives him this, um, this object lesson, right? So in chapter 4, Jonah is so upset, right? And he basically tells, uh, he basically tells God, um, right, because God comes to him and says, uh, is it right for you to be angry? And Jonah's like, yes, it is. I'm so upset, right, like a toddler, like my son would do when I take away his bread, because he really likes bread, right? And I'm like, it's okay, you're two, you can eat carbs, right? So, so he's really upset, and then, and then God comes to him and um, gives him this object lesson. But, but what Jonah says to him first is Jonah basically says to him, see, I knew you would do this. I knew that if I came to Nineveh and preached to them, they would turn. And I knew if they turned, God, you're such a softy. Man, you would relent and save them. And which is exactly what I did not want to happen. And Jonah tells him again, like, I, it's better for me to die than to live. He would rather die than live in a world where Nineveh is spared. And so he leaves the city and he goes up on this uh, hill and he watches to see, you know, maybe the city won't be destroyed. And he builds this shelter and God causes this plant to grow up over Nineveh, or grow up, grow up over Jonah. And this is that 1%, I promise, where Jonah's like, I'm so happy. Everything's going to be all right. I have this plant. Thank you. I don't know if he thanks God, but he's happy. The text says that he's happy. Um, but it's short-lived, right? 24 hours later or at dawn, like a worm comes and chews away. God provides the worm to come and chew away this plant. And the plant dies. And then the sun comes up and beats on Jonah's head. And then God provides this like very hot wind, like what we got going on outside, like very hot weather. And Jonah grows faint. He's back at square one. He's so upset. And he says, it would be better for me to die than to live. And then God comes to him and says, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And Jonah says, yes, it is. I hate everything. And then God says to him, you are concerned about this plant that you had for maybe 24 hours. And it's gone. And you had no control over it growing or providing you shade. You had no control over it, but it's gone. Should I not have concern for an entire city of 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left? And that's how the story ends. There's nothing else. You never hear Jonah's response. And that's so intentional. Because the book of Jonah really isn't about how will Jonah respond. It's about how the reader will respond. It's about how you and I are going to respond. It's biblical inception. Right? Like God is planting this idea in our head. He's, he's using this story to address the proclivity in all of our hearts to other people, to reduce the image of God in people, especially when they've wronged us. And his, God's object lesson for us today is the cross. It's the cross. Because what happened at the cross it was a horrible, the cross of Jesus Christ was a horrible criminal's death. You see, the catastrophic consequences of humanity's choices to run from God on full display. This terrible, horrible criminal's death. It tells us that we could never work ourselves out of our problem. We could never fix our fractured human hearts. Right? You need somebody else to come and reset your heart. You need something outside of yourself to address the selfishness within you. But we see our accountability on full display. But at the very same time, you see the extraordinary lens that God goes to to rescue us, to show us his mercy, which outpaces, outmatches, outruns us every time. Because it's not you or me on the cross, it's God himself, God in human skin, taking the blow for us. I, I've heard one lyricist describe the story of the cross this way. When have you ever heard the story of the hero who dies for the villain? That's the story of the cross because the reality is, my friends, is that 
Each one of us deserves, God has every right to other us, to treat us as his enemies. He has every right to do it. It's only because of his grace and his mercy that he forgives us, that he offers us the cross, that he offers us new life through the, the resurrection of Jesus. He will always outmatch, outpace, outrun us with his mercy. And we need this message of the cross more today than we've ever needed it. Because what, when you actually absorb that truth into your heart, when you actually put faith, when you turn your life and trust in Jesus to be the, the leader and the, the, the rescuer of your life, what it does to you is because when you come to the cross, you have to confess, I've failed. You have to own that I've jacked it up, that I've messed it up. And the cross gives you the humility to do that because God says, I'm not going to destroy you when you come to me and confess and own your failure. I'm going to forgive you. So that then gives you the humility to turn around and tell people and confess to others, confess to God when you have as we're looking at our passage and this story and Jonah's heart, when you've othered somebody, when you've seen bigotry and prejudice in your own heart, I've seen it in my heart. If you have a human heart, you're not immune to it, right? The sin that Jonah dealt with, we can't say like, Jonah, you're so jacked up, right? We are in the same boat. And the cross gives you the humility to own that. It also gives you the power when you have been othered by somebody, especially when that's happened by your enemy, or especially when that's happened in places like the church, when you've been othered, when you've been treated as less than. It gives you the, the power to forgive and to heal. Only the unique message of the cross gives you that power, the humility to own your failure, and the power to forgive others. It restores your relationship with God so that then you can move out and have restored relationships with other people. Let me close with this. Let's walk back through it. Right, no matter the extraordinary attempts that you and I have gone to to run from God, he's even more extraordinary in running after us. God shows no favoritism, but actively pursues, sings a song across all of the scriptures that I am after every nation, including yours, including ours, including mine. And when God has every right to other us, he chooses not to. He chooses to show us grace and to forgive us, right? God is saying to you and to me, God is saying, should I not have concern for your enemy? Should you not have concern for people who are different than you? Should we not have concern for this great city?